think of a supercar, you tend to think of something that's low, that's mid-engine, it's exotic and it's Italian probably. And maybe something that was built in the late 60s or 70s. So this car isn't Italian, it's German. This car isn't mid-engine, it's front-engine. And its styling is more Monaco chic than Moonbase Alpha. But there's a very good reason why this car should be considered as the world's first supercar. It's the Mercedes 300 SL Gullwing. It's 61 years old and it's a peach. This very car, this very car will be auctioned by RM Sotheby's in Paris. On the 3rd of February, you must watch it, Evo will be streaming the auction live. You'll be able to see this car on the block. And what a car. What a beautiful, beautiful car. To really understand the Gullwing, you've got to go back to the uh, Second World War, the end of the Second World War. At the end of the war, Stuttgart industrial complexes across Germany were absolutely wiped out by Allied bombing. There was nothing left. The bosses of Daimler Benz, they even said, that's it, it's finished for the company. But they kept going and they built sedans, and within six years, they decided to go back to racing. Just six years after the Second World War, now a team got together, Neubau and Ullenhau, legendary guys, and they thought, right, let's build a Grand Prix car. Now this Grand Prix car had to have one of the engines in the road cars at that time, a cast iron block engine, so the rest of the car had to be really light. So they built this wonderful, complex, multi-tube chassis, lightweight chassis to take a heavier engine clothed in a really slippery body. And this happened from design to the first testing on the German roads in just six months in 1951, from June to around November time, from design to on the road. Remarkable. And then what happened the following year? The race car cleaned up. The W194 Gullwing race car in Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. 24 hours of Le Mans, it absolutely cleaned up. Do you know what? That could have been the end of the Gullwing story if it wasn't for a guy in America called Max Hoffman. Now, Max Hoffman was the distributor for Mercedes-Benz cars in the States. And he went to the board and said, I want a, I want a road car based on your Gullwing race car. I can sell it. I can sell it, he said. The board weren't particularly interested. So Hoffman, remarkably, he said, I'm going to order 500 now. So the board quite quickly said, OK, we'll build it. So a road car was born out of the race car. And that road car had a few changes, but not as many as you'd think. So the race drivers complained about too much heat in the cabin, heat that was soaked through from the engine. So the road car engineers created some vents on the car, on the road car, that would pull some of that heat away from the engine and away from the cockpit area. And one of those vents is the now kind of iconic egg crate grill that you see on the side of this car, and as you see on the side of some of the modern Mercedes cars as well. So the big change occurred under the bonnet. The race car had around 175 horsepower with a carb-fed engine. The road car switched over to direct injection. It was the first time a road car would have direct injection. In fact, the next time a road car would have direct injection was well into the 2000s, so so far ahead of its time as car. One of the benefits of having direct injection was the engine had more power. So this car here had around 215, sometimes 220 horsepower. And the race car had 175. So the public were being offered a road car with more power than the Grand Prix race car. No wonder Max Hoffman and other distributors around the world couldn't sell enough of them. 1,400 were sold in three years. A remarkable story. So what's this car like to drive? does it drive like a supercar? Well, let's think about the performance to start with. It does 0 to 6 in around eight and a half, nine seconds. It's got around 215 horsepower, around 200 pounds per feet of torque, and we'll do around 135 miles an hour. So today, not massively impressive. In the 50s, very, very impressive. The gear shift is absolutely sensational very direct. In fact, I'm trying to think of another gear shift that's better than this one. Maybe a little catering or something like that. 
they're synchro on all four gears, so you don't have to double the clutch too much. It's nice to flip it on the down change. Maybe the most backward feature is the drum brakes, drum brakes all round. At the time, Jaguar was beginning to pioneer disc brakes. And actually, this car would never, the coupe would never receive disc brakes. It always had drums throughout its life. You have to really think about your braking points. But maybe that summarizes this car. You have to think about the way you drive it. Now, a swing axle at the rear creates very unusual camber changes when you have a pitch or a roll movement in the car. So it's kind of like the tires are actually lifting off the ground if you lift off in a corner. And this car had a real reputation, a real reputation for having a sting in its tail. And we're not going to find out today. Sorry about that. It's worth a million pounds and it's up for sale. So, was this the world's first supercar? Well, some may argue the Bugatti Type 35 was the world's first supercar, but this certainly does take a claim. And if you don't think it's the world's first supercar, please comment below. I don't think there's any doubt that this is a supercar. Supercars always have interesting backstories. A really fascinating catalyst, the reason why it exists. And this car has that. It has the performance, performance that was extraordinary in the day. It's a very, very beautiful, well-resolved, four-man function kind of shape. And its significance in the history of sports cars just cannot be, cannot be denied whether you think it's a supercar or not. Whoever buys this car, not only are they going to get one of the very best gull wings around, but they're going to get one of the most important cars ever made. A true super car. So yeah, check it out. 3rd of February, the RM Sotheby's Paris sale, live on the Evo YouTube channel.